Very good. Um, the American Jewish experience is a unique one for our people. And it's also the name of your book. As the Journal of American Ethnic History put it, American Jews grappled with the dilemma of synthesizing their Jewish and American identities and remaining committed to, the Jew to Jewish survival in a culturally pluralist pluralistic society at the same time that they moved to embrace the promises of the American dream. Can you explain to our audience what makes the Jewish American experience stand out? Um, I've tried in many of my books, American Jewish experience was uh, first published uh, many, many years ago, uh, but uh, really it's been one of the goals of my scholarship to uh, try and figure out what is distinctive about uh, uh, the American Jewish experience, about the world of Jews uh, in, um, in America. And there are many things one can uh, point to. Um, you know, maybe one would begin with a constitution that, um, and, and what's important in the constitution it, the word Jew isn't in it. Jews get their rights along with everybody else. And indeed, the First Amendment will divorce government from religion altogether. Congress make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Even in England, there was an established church. Jews were dissenters. And for a long time in England, Jews couldn't uh, be members of parliament. Uh, but uh, from the very beginning, the Jews uh, were eligible for national office, not always for state office. And they could look back at America's founders and at America's greatest documents and draw sustenance and appeal to them. Uh, in a way, it put their enemies on the defensive. Uh, whereas in Europe, Jews needed emancipation. And uh, that meant everybody remembered a time when Jews were second-class citizens. Um, there's also another very important element there. Emancipation in the European sense was what we would call a quid pro quo. We give Jews full rights, but they have to change their ways. Uh, they have to change um, uh, uh, their education, their language, their dress, uh, and so on. And it was quite clear that if Jews didn't change as much as their neighbors wanted, you would take emancipation away. So, uh, uh, we uh, know all sorts of cases where, uh, let's say, after Napoleon, uh, uh, some of the restrictions are returned and Hitler uh, 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 takes away Jewish emancipation. But in America, as George Washington pointed out, religious liberty was an inherent natural right. That's Washington's term. That's very important. An inherent natural right can never be taken away. So that too was an important uh, distinction. In many European countries, Jews are the only out group. They're the only dissenters. They're the only non-Christians. Um, so when uh, the community uh, turns on somebody uh, who is different, that's the Jews. Actually, in America, that was not the case. Um, uh, there were lots of outgroups, of course, uh, tragically. There were African-Americans who bore the brunt. Uh, um, uh, but there were all sorts of other outgroups at a different uh, time. Uh, we once had an anti-Catholic party in America, political party. Um, uh, there was a lot of anti-Mormonism in America, and so on and so forth. So 
uh, Jews were not the only out group, and there were a lot of, and, and it's still true, there were a lot of groups in America who knew what it meant um, uh, to uh, be persecuted. Um, so that too, I think, is important. More than we realize, the two-party system distinguishes America still from the, uh, uh, the system in other countries. In a two-party system with very close ele uh, elections, both parties understand that they want to attract as many voters as possible, and they will work hard not to alienate any block of voters that may cost you the election. Um, it's totally different in Europe where you have many, many parties and you make your coalition after the election. During the election, you can say terrible and vile things about other groups. Yeah, You're a Christian Democrat. You make clear you're not uh, going to uh, stand for having non-Christians. Then you make a coalition and you forget about it. But those earlier charges are remembered. Not so in America with two parties, each party appealing for a broad coalition. Um, uh, it, it quickly became clear, not every president has done it, but it quickly became clear that a big tent politics and trying to bring people in uh, would be more successful than uh, keeping people out. And Jews benefited enormously uh, in America uh, from the two-party system. Uh, there's much more really that one um, uh, could say, but I, I would say also that the fact that you had many other groups that sought to maintain elements of their heritage. They were proud. I'm proud of being Irish and American. I'm proud of being Italian and American. Um, the idea that someone had multiple identities and was proud of all of them is normal um, uh, in America. Indeed, um, uh, you know, we have St. Patrick's Day is widely observed and, and Columbus Day uh, until a few years ago, the Italians were all at a parade and so on. Uh, so Jews were not embarrassed uh, to exert uh, their uh, identity and to insist that they were indeed both American and Jewish. Um, in many other countries, uh, the assumption was Jews had to give up uh, those elements of their identity if they wanted to be accepted. At best, they could have a kind of private religion because that they would allow. But in public, you had to call yourself uh, 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 you know, a uh, 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 German of Jewish descent or of the Mosaic persuasion. Uh, uh, that was not the case in America where you had so many ethnic groups. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and this is the last question. So it's a little bit long-winded, um, but it's argued by contemporary thinkers such as Kenneth Seaskin that the Torah is foremost a book of philosophy since it points to an ideal or a goal as a transformational ethic that is dynamic and adaptable to the winds of change. Slavery comes to mind as a dark reality that existed universally without a nation standing up to eradicate it. That is until the Torah flipped the script. Since our collective memory was as slaves from Egypt, the Torah replaces slavery with indentured servitude where the master is at risk of capital punishment if he abuses his employee. Only he is subject to the law and must provide the ultimate care to his, to his servant. Although America has a dark and regrettable history of slavery, it's significant that the biblical ideal of all men are created equal permeated the American consciousness 
and ultimately led to the abolishment of slavery, which is very significant since slavery continues in some countries today. Your father, Nachum Sarna, of blessed memory, he focused on the polemical advances the Torah used to transition primitive polytheists to a world of morally conscious monotheists. How much has that influenced your worldview? And what are some of the lessons of your father that stick with you until this day? Um, I was glad, uh, Abba, my father, um, indeed, uh, influenced by an earlier scholar named Yechezkel Kaufman. My father looked at the ancient Near East and over and over again, he found that the Torah, that um, uh, Judaism was greatly advanced. In other words, whereas earlier people said, oh, Jews were just, uh, uh, you know, like other ancient people, look at all these parallels. Uh, my father was more interested in the differences and time and again, um, uh, he showed that uh, the Torah was really um, morally superior and that Jews um, uh, broke away uh, from uh, the morality of their surroundings. It doesn't always mean that everything in the Torah um, uh, you know, is the same as in the 21st century. But uh, it was a very different way of looking at the at the Bible than uh, say Wellhausen or others uh, who had such a negative view and tended to um, uh, contrast Jews with the religion of Jesus, which they insisted uh, was far superior. Now, on the matter of slavery, I would say um, that uh, the Bible and later rabbinic Judaism distinguishes between the enslavement of Jews, Eved Ivri in Hebrew, and the enslavement of non-Jews, Eved Kena'ani. Um, and uh, the laws are different and so on. Um, I think some are deeply disturbed at the idea that not just the Bible, but rabbinic tradition knew slavery, and they need to be reminded, uh, as an, my, another one of my teachers showed, uh, the great historian of anti-slavery, uh, the late uh, David Brian Davis, that really anti-slavery was a brand new idea in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Pesach doesn't say that all slavery is bad. We celebrate how Jews move from slavery to freedom, and implicitly, as you suggest, uh, there are criticisms of slavery and especially of the way Pharaoh worked his slaves, but there's nothing in Passover that says slavery as an institution is wrong. And the reason it wasn't there is that almost uh, every country uh, had some slaves um, uh, uh, through most of history uh, until we advanced. Uh, but I do absolutely agree that the fact that the Bible uh, put rules on how you treat your slaves and will even punish the master for mistreating, that had an impact indeed. Uh, Rabbi uh, Rafal, uh, who was probably uh, among the most learned and certainly the best orator of um, uh, uh, the mid 19th century among Jews, he gave a celebrated speech about slavery, Jews and slavery. Most people remember it only because uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, slavery is in the Bible. So how can uh, we say that all slavery is wrong? But if you read the rest of the speech, what he's saying is the South should treat slaves much better than they do. It should follow biblical law and not mistreat the slaves. So he really made 
uh, the very same point. He somehow thought one could find a middle ground. Moreover, uh, and this is also hinted at in your question, by the middle of the 19th century, there were other people who were interested in what we might today call the spirit of the Bible, broad ethical ideas from the Bible that influence and all men are created equal. The notion that everybody goes back to Adam is an absolutely remarkable notion. Uh, it's totally different from the racial idea, uh, you know, that suggests uh, 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 that you're doomed uh, by having one drop of the wrong kind of blood. And um, uh, those ideas about equality also influence some Jews. So some of the opponents of Rabbi Rafal said, you are paying too much attention to what it says in Exodus. Remember the spirit of the Bible in Genesis, in the prophets, about equality, and uh, indeed they supported um, uh, uh, abolition of slavery. What's fascinating is that both sides drew from the same Bible. Abraham Lincoln knew that. They read the same Bible, he famously said, and um, uh, that, that was the Jewish Bible. Now, uh, you asked me what I learned uh, from my father, Allah Shalom, of course, one learns a tremendous amount. My father was a scholar, and I think as much as anything, I learned certain habits. Uh, when my father had a moment, he was in his study, uh, working, studying, learning. Uh, it wasn't like he came home and put up his legs and watch television at night. Uh, indeed, that was his best time for learning. Um, and my father had a strong sense that Jewish civilization was interconnected. Uh, he believed nothing Jewish is alien, and anyone who reads his work uh, will find uh, that he quotes from the widest range of sources. Uh, sometimes contemporary science informed uh, his understanding of a verse in the Bible um, uh, or you know, some other obscure uh, source. Um, I remember clearly uh, uh, when I was a graduate student, there was a lot of new work on the vast population explosion of the 19th century all over the world, but especially in Jewish life. Why did it happen? Uh, what was its impact? And my father was so pleased because to him it showed that the biblical account of Exodus of how the Jews uh, grew and multiplied in Egypt actually had historical parallels and just as um, the Jewish community grew four or five fold from the beginning of the 19th century to the end, uh, so it followed that there were other times when you can see vast population explosions such as the Bible declares. So my father drew from all learning. No learning was uh, to his mind uh, 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 heretical or off base, you could learn from it, you could uh, find that it illuminated, um, uh, you know, whatever text uh, he uh, was studying. He had a vast library and he knew those books, he had read them. And, um, and finally, my father tried to write for a broad audience. There were many scholars who write just for scholars. I wrote some articles for his fellow scholars, but he felt a great responsibility to try and write for a broad, intelligent lay audience uh, that he wanted to influence. Uh, 
be books like Understanding Genesis, Exploring Exodus. They've been read by tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. And that's just what he wanted, uh, even though, you know, some others said, how can you be a real scholar if so many people can understand you? And my father thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, 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 Rashi uh, was a great scholar and people understand him and he helped people understand uh, a text. And my father uh, drew and was deeply influenced uh, by the history of um, earlier biblical commentators and who they saw as, uh, as their audience. So um, I, I have tried uh, to follow some of that. I worked very hard in my uh, own writing to try and write so that any intelligent reader uh, can understand my work. I'm very happy that, say, my book on American Judaism, which is my one volume uh, history, uh, has been read by tens of thousands uh, of people and is taught uh, across the spectrum of Jewish life and uh, in, to many people in American religion uh, read it. I meet all sorts of people who tell me I've had to read it and was uh, also translated. So, I, you know, in many, many ways, I uh, can see sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, uh, that I have um, been influenced by my, uh, by my uh, father of blessed memory. Uh, it's, of course, interesting that I've worked on American Jewish history, because I dare say if there was one subject my father was not expert in, it was American Jewish history. He was not born in America. Uh, every once in a while, he'd hear of, you know, one of our more, um, uh, one of our lesser known presidents. So, you know, it was a president once named Rutherford B. Hayes. And uh, he could, uh, you know, tell you some of the monarchs in Europe. But, uh, he didn't know American history well, uh, but uh, he appreciated it. And I have to say that he always encouraged me. I have quite a few books that, as I became interested, he gave me. Uh, he thought it was splendid. Uh, but uh, there is somebody who wrote that I went into the only Jewish field that my father knew nothing about. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 there, but in many ways, as you have discerned, uh, I do feel that there is a tradition uh, that I carry forward, and um, uh, you know, I'm very proud of that, and feel very fortunate to uh, bear uh, the legacy of uh, of my late father Nachum Sina. Wow, beautiful. And we, we're also very much uh, influenced by him. We're actually, we have his books right here. The ones that you just uh -huh. can yeah. understand. Yeah, there's only two of them. There are quite a few others. Only, only, yeah, only yeah. two. Uh, there's quite a few. Exploring Exodus and Understanding Genesis are our favorites, but we still have a lot more reading to do. And really just um, this, as Orthodox Jews, um, this is actually, for a lot of people, it, it's scary to read these kind of books. But really what it is, what it does for us is actually strengthens our our faith, because it, like you mentioned, the it's not necessarily about how Judaism is similar to um, the other cultures in the ancient world, but how, what are the contrasts and what are the, you know, what is the Torah doing to transition us away from these uh, um, outdated primitive way of thinking? Um, so idolatry. yeah, like idolatry and all that. So really it, he gives such an amazing perspective on things and um, kind of like biblical maximalism he's he he sees things that you know a lot of people refuse to look at because it's kind of like uh politically incorrect when you're in that world um you know so I, we, re we really value um your father and your and your work so uh thank you so much would you can you um plug one of your books like how can we find you well i have a um i have a new book of my uh, articles uh, um called Coming to Terms with America uh, uh, by Jewish Publications. So I probably my best known book, and it was really a, 
a synthesis and, and covers the history of American Judaism from the colonial era to the present. And there's a second edition that really brings it to the present. Uh, it's called American Judaism, a history. Uh, that's certainly the book that I uh, spent the longest writing and so on. But uh, in, in this broadcast, we have uh, devoted some time to my books on uh, Ulysses S. Grant, when General Grant expelled the Jews, my book on Abraham Lincoln with Ben Chappelle, a Lincoln and the Jews, and I have early books uh, as well, uh, which are all available uh, on Amazon, um, uh, which is probably the easiest way to get them. And, uh, you know, obviously, I'm always glad to... Uh, uh, to know that uh, there are uh, readers and uh, uh, and listeners and students. Thanks very much. You wanted to say one thing? I wanted to just ask the professor. We I don't think we touched upon it, unless I'm wrong. What what initially made you curious about American history? How did that? What what inspired you to get into this field? Well, as I hinted, I'm the first member of my family to be born in America. I used to kid my older brother, I could be president. Uh, uh, I, I would say not <laughs> kid at all. Uh, at that time, it was serious. I could be president. He couldn't be president. He's still born abroad. <laughs> uh, but I think as an American, anyone who is a first generation born in America, your parents grew up in a different place with different norms, different uh, associations. So one is curious about uh, this country. And um, I really, uh, I remember even when I was a student in elementary school in New York at Ramaz, which is still a very good school. Uh, when I was at Ramaz, I was interested in American history and would read about it and try to understand it. And um, naturally, um, that led to, well, what's the history of Jews in America? And really, already in high school, I became interested. And maybe because I grew up in such a scholarly family, it became clear to me that there was not much of a literature in American Jewish history, that this field hadn't much been studied. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, if you came from a scholarly family and you saw a piece of Jewish studies that all people had ignored, uh, you think, good, uh, this is uh, my area. So, um, uh, already in high school, I began writing paper. Uh, I did a long paper on a subject that unfortunately is again in the news on American anti-Semitism. Those days, a senior in high school would write a research paper, which, and I did. Um, and, uh, you know, already when I entered college, I knew that this is what I wanted to study. And um, uh, in those days, the American Jewish Historical Society was on the Brandeis campus. That was one of the reasons I went there. And all my years at Brandeis, I worked at the American Jewish Historical Society. So, uh, you know, I, uh, um, I, I uh, was almost groomed, uh, I would say, uh, in this uh, uh, field. And uh, in those days, there weren't a lot of people. And uh, uh, I, um, uh, you know, entered into it and, and had uh, the great good fortune to be mentored by uh, Jacob Rader Marcus, who more or less invented the field and um, uh, knew the whole field uh, remarkably well. And, you know, I've now been uh, uh, in this field for um, uh, formerly in this field for more than 40 years. Uh, uh, you know, the Israelites were only in the desert for 40 years. So uh, I, uh, uh, <coughs> but even before I was a scholar in the field, I, of course, had been working in it. 
and uh, really um, published uh, my uh, first articles, uh, uh, which you know soon will come up to uh, a 50th anniversary of my first published article. So oh, you know, yeah. it's a long, uh, uh, it, it's it's a long uh, story, but not different, I think than others who had the good fortune to grow up in scholarly families and were encouraged from a young age, perhaps, to be scholars themselves. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Delighted to do so. Have a good Shabbos and Chodesh uh, Tov uh, uh, and so on. And uh, I look forward to seeing the podcast. Yes. Thank you so much. Take care. Be well. Bye-bye.